from Trimble Construction, you're listening to the Connected Construction Show, where we connect you to the contractors, owners, designers, engineers, and construction professionals who are finding better ways to work. And now, here's your host, Matt Sprague. All right, so now we're going to uh, pivot from our conversation last week, which was the data availability topic uh, around operations and maintenance. And now we're going to kind of, uh, as I mentioned, I think last week we're going to double click. Uh, now we'll, we'll maybe just move over into the same idea, but now with our head wrapped around the planning and design phase. So um, opening it back up to, to everybody. So we, uh, uh, Joe, Aaron, Zach, and Rick, uh, you know, so in your views, um, what data is critical at the planning stage to properly scope a project um, or, 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 you know, re- whether it's, you know, replacing something or whether it's, it's just updating and, and existing. So, you know, like what, what, or, or where is the data uh, most effectively obtained? You know, well, um, we operate a couple of really large water reclamation facilities that have, have lots of assets in them. Uh, and a vast majority of those assets are are interrelated with one another, right? Pumps and associated valves and instrumentation and devices. So as we're contemplating a new project, um, <clears throat> you know, where perhaps uh, we have a, a, a set of pumps that are at end of life, it's really important for the, the group that's planning or designing that new project to understand, well, yeah, somebody told us they need to replace the pumps, but what else should we be contemplating replacing associated with that pump, right? Because the people on the O&M side said the pump's bad, it needs to be replaced. But if we're going to go through the effort to replace that pump, right, you know, looking at potentially up, up, upping technology with the pump, changing, you know, various things associated with the pump, should we also be looking at the uh, piping that's on the suction and discharge side of that pipe uh, pump, for example, you know, maybe that, maybe that's two years from the end of life. It, It doesn't, doesn't have any current problems now, but if we're here doing a project, what else should we be doing, right? And I think one of the challenges that we are currently trying to overcome is how do we efficiently get the data for those ancillary assets um, associated with that pump, for example, to the people that are making planning and design decisions for for the project being contemplated. Uh, and I and I think we're getting much better at that. But there's clearly clearly a ways we can still go to to reach our utmost uh, level of performance, right? And it's and it's again, it comes back to making sure those that are making the decisions and planning and design have all the all the access to the data that can allow them to make good decisions. Yeah, I like that response from Rick. Um, I'll just add, right, when we think about planning and design, it's it's sort of a spatial exercise. You know, what is the space needed to accomplish whatever the project scope or goals are? You know, it's a new facility. So what is an approximate, you know, square footage of that facility? Where do we have that amount of square footage available to us? And what other infrastructure exists today in that location or in proximity to that location. So there's sort of a spatial exercise or, you know, if there is something already there, but this is, you know, prime real estate for the goal it's trying to accomplish, the project is trying to accomplish, do we need to relocate something somewhere else? And, you know, there's sort of a spatial arrangement of, you know, where do we place this particular, you know, piece of uh, a building or an infrastructure or uh, assets or equipment. Um, but yeah, to, to Rick's point, I think that's very intelligent. We also have to know, you know, of things nearby, right? What is their what is their condition? Um, the the amount of effort it takes to stand up a new project, get contracts going, get funding going, right? The momentum there is really important in establishing some additional scope, right? We just have to be careful not to let that scope creep too large. Um, and, and that's really sort of the, you know, the job of project managers and engineers and designers to help maintain that scope and put it in a, a, a box that's still going to accomplish the goals of the project without um, overshooting the budget by too much, right? But um, 
you know, you only get so many chances to go in and replace or fix aging infrastructure. So it's really important to try to take advantage of that while the opportunity is hot. Yeah, and this is something that will I know Zach and, and Joe will will appreciate, um, and, and I'm sure Rick will as well. But you know, it, it's really about having you know good quality existing condition base maps in place that um, designers planners can can use in in their efforts and, and work that we we know if for example if we need to tap in for for power for for a new building um, or sanitary sewer that um, it's not going to disrupt or cause conflict with with existing systems up or downstream that that's tying into. Um, and, you know, in many cases we can leverage, you know, modeling software within GIS to, to perform those models and, and, and analytics to, to kind of get a rough order of magnitude. Um, but, you know, we, we really want to make sure that the information is there and available for, for them to, to make those decisions. Because ultimately, when we start looking at maybe something that's more along the lines of a, of a design build, we want to really reduce the amount of, of risk and unknown to, to, to the builder um, so that we get a more credible, accurate bid that's coming in. Because that information in those preliminary designs, you know, be at 15% or so, um, accounts for, you know, not needing to, to do additional verification or, or work that a lot of those calculations and, and risks and unknowns have, have been calculated based off of data that, again, we have confidence in um, and have made those informed decisions on in, in advance or that, you know, the, the agency and organization has already kind of taken on some of those risks um, and, and their calculations. So it ultimately produces or can produce a, a better um, bid. Um, through producing a, a better plan and an ultimate um, preliminary design that they would go out for bid. Yeah, you know what you guys said there is really kind of interesting. I think Aaron and I kind of took at it two, two slightly different approaches, but ultimately, at least from my perspective, and I suspect uh, others here on the on the podcast would agree with it, the vast majority of challenge we, challenges we have coming out of planning and design and going into construction, which will talk about a little bit later is um, we didn't have good data available for planning and design and that now has resulted in challenges as we move to that next step so right the you know the low-hanging fruit is get better information in planning and design from what you already yes. have that will make that will make the future better uh, absolutely and I think you yeah, know the the strike more the iron top plan the the challenge of planning really is making you know a lot of very big difficult decisions in a very short amount of time based on the best available data. And I think this is where, you know, if technology has changed and made this thing, you know, made, made this delivery process, I think it has, stands to aid the planning and initial design process, you know, best. Um, and I, I think, you know, there's an anecdote that comes to mind, right, where there, there's been some uh, certain area at the, uh, at the airport, uh, there have been some questions as to, you know, distances between, you know, various uh, existing structural elements for some sort of rehab project and underground utilities. And, you know, currently, while we, you know, are in the process of really federating all the different pieces and parts of information and representing as a 3D model, it is incomplete. Um, however, where it is in its current state, you know, I'm finding we're able to answer questions a lot quicker uh, that are at least to the precision that's required at a planning phase um, than, than ever before. And, you know, the one specific example comes to mind where, you know, previous projects had wrapped up and you know, as part of the closeout, there was a LIDAR scan done of the area. Um, and by, you know, basically by, by circumstance, there was this new project, uh, happened to be caught within that LIDAR scan. And, you know, the question of, you know, certain spatial distances between, you know, key elements of this, this new planning project, um, you know, was a question instead of having to, you know, go or I'll just say dumpster diving into a bunch of old as built, you know, the LIDAR scan was able to quickly just answer some quick dimensional questions, you know, in a matter of, you know, a couple minutes, what, probably would have been a week-long endeavor, which is really key in a planning environment. You know, you're able to make some good decisions of what, you know, is this decision even worthwhile pursuing and kind of exploring further. Um, and so there's, there's been a lot of value to that. And, you know, I think structuring existing information, you know, in whatever form you have it, um, you know, in the planning phase, I, I found just, you know, more information is, is better than less. Um, there's really not much conditioning, you know, required because you almost have a Swiss Army knife thing. So by that, I mean, you know, having an old hand-drawn as built, having a, a, a building information model, regardless of the level of development, 
having a LiDAR scan, having photography, having all these different pieces, having a GIS map of the general area, you know, all of those tools are really, you know, used by planning departments to, to really, you know, make these decisions. And I think that is, you know, certainly uh, something that's, you know, fundamentally changed from even five, 10 years ago. Yeah, you, you know, we, we talked a bit before about that, that single source of truth for, for data. And I think, you know, you, you kind of got me thinking when you said, you know, sifting through, you know, hundreds, thousands of, of as built. I, I think document control, um, records management control is, is critically important. It, it shouldn't be acceptable to have to sift through hundreds, thousands of, of, of PDFs, right? Or, or even, you know, um, drawing files to try to determine what's the latest, what's most current. Um, but they do need to be organized and they need to be not just organized in a single location, but they need to be searchable, filterable, um, so that to be able to answer those question, questions quickly, Zach, as you noted, um, someone can go in and find quickly what they need and have the confidence that it's the most accurate representation uh, for, for them to, to get the data that they need to, to be able to, to advance their plan or design efforts. Um, and I think that that's lacking in, in a lot of, you know, agencies I've seen is it, it's more that end in mind first, but they don't necessarily value the, the organization um, of the, the actual designs that are coming in and the, the, the ancillary information that goes behind those that is very important um, that, that are needed when a planner or designer is reflecting back and um, using that to, to help influence future work. I would absolutely agree with what you just said, Aaron, um, and, and agencies are in, in, in different spots uh, on that journey, right? Uh, Fifteen years ago, we were probably in the, hey, I need to find as-built drawings for, you know, something we built 40 years ago, and, you know, off it would go to a particular person that is, you know, well-versed in, in searching our old as-builts because they weren't indexed and they weren't uh, electronically searchable. Well, well, the step we took after that was, you know, index them and make them searchable, which made that a little bit easier. Um, right now that we are, you know, starting in the road of BIM, not only uh, are they of those drawings indexed and searchable, but, you know, I can go find that location where my project might be within a BIM. And then just because of linking of information and data, now I can instantly find all of those as-built drawings, right? So uh, you know, we've gone from wildly inefficient uh, 15 years ago, you know, to uh, a pretty significant step up in efficiency, you know, five years ago to, you know, another huge leap in efficiency uh, with BIM. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't matter, I think, where you're at on that journey as long as you're moving forward towards making it more efficient. And you clearly can't go from, you know, the, the lowest level um, to the highest level in, in, in one stop, right? You, it is a journey. It is an evolution. It's certainly not a revolution. So what, what, um, what pitfalls can be avoided by having uh, efficient access to this information? And, and I'm going to add uh, kind of like another uh, layer and, and maybe an example, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So R Rick, you know, w within, you know, uh, the, like the city uh, of Milwaukee, for an example, you know, you're talking about good asset data to help with planning and design of um, of of new assets or rehabilitating assets. However, I also feel there is a, uh, and and I'm assuming within aviation, there's similar scenarios that if that asset information and um, subsequent planning information is not made available to roads and bridges, the perfect example always is, is like, hey, we just redid this section of road. And then the next year you're like, I'm digging it up because that information was, was not made, a, it was not made available. So th th I see that as an obvious uh, example of a, of a pitfall. So reiterating my question after I went on my bit of a narrative there, what pitfalls can be avoided by having efficient access to the information that you're talking about? Well, you mentioned one of them, right? Uh, and one of the significant ones is, um, you know, our organization is pretty large. Um, O'Hare Airport is pretty large. Lots of projects going on at any given time, right? In our world, mm -hmm. you know, at any point in time, we might have 150 capital projects um, at, at one point or another in their life cycle. And most of them are not sitting off on an island, right? They can and are interrelated to one another. So making sure that, you know, what somebody is doing on project A can be um, 
efficiently understood and learned by somebody associated with Project B uh, is critically important because, again, you don't want to you don't want to build that road that you dig up a year later. So there needs to be some communication between those two projects to say, hey, you know, maybe maybe you shouldn't do this last segment of road because we need access to that to do our bridge, for example, right? Um, you know, and I think technology and enterprise systems. Um, We've always had the ability to, to do that communication. It's just, you know, the person that's responsible for Project A, he doesn't really care about Project B. So I think with technology, we're able to make that communication so efficient um, that it, that you don't have to search it out as often as you would have in the past, that it's just it's there and you have access to it. And I think that's what's what's uh, been hugely beneficial in helping us avoiding some pitfalls in that area. I guess, Rick, I have a question for you. Do you find that the questions are changing, um, you know, for folks that need information perhaps you know, from, from planners and, and whatnot? You know, I think one observation that I've made is, you know, I've, I've heard the question changing from, you know, I, I need an as-built. Um, can, you, can you dig that up? And, you know, if you were to, you know, probe a little bit deeper, and this may be a, a couple of years ago, you know, but if you probe a little deeper, is, you know, what is the actual question you're trying to answer? Um, and then realizing, well, you know, the ASBO will certainly answer that information, but there's, you know, all these other tools or other ways you can kind of look at this. There's a map, there's a, there's a, a BIM model, there's something else that will actually answer the question not only better, but, pro but certainly quicker. Are you finding that the, que the, the questions are changing or do you see a change in the staff of folks that aren't in the day-to-day -day of dealing with the data? Yeah, I think, yeah, absolutely. To your point that the questions are changing because, um, you know, I think, Years ago, right, the, the question was simply, I need something about this, and I'm going to hopefully find it in an as-built to, uh, I think now people already understand that that as-built exists, so they don't have to ask that question. They're, they're innately already thinking, you know, one step further down in detail to, okay, I, I know this information exists. What, what other information about that asset might be beneficial to, to my planning and design of this next project, right? So they're, um, you know, I, I think they're, they're automatically being able to assume that they have access to that, that first base level of information and their brains are already working down to, to, to go one step further than they might otherwise, right? The level of effort maybe is still the same, but they're getting a lot more bang for their buck than they had in the past. Yeah. Um, and I will add from the perspective of, uh, right, pitfalls that can be avoided. You know, the last thing we want to do when we are planning and designing a project and then it moves into construction and commission is to find out late in the game from our facilities management people or, um, you know, our operational divisions sort of on the other side of the organization that, you know, there was a piece of equipment or, you know, a pipeline that the project didn't touch and it should have. Um, and that piece of equipment or pipe or wh whatever other asset, you know, is old. It has a history of maintenance issues or failures. Why didn't we address this by the project, right? You know, that's the last thing you want to hear late in the game. So I think that pitfall can be avoided by, you know, everything my colleagues have just said, but also, you know, better informed uh, systems uh, on the EAM or CMMS side of the organization. Um, right, and that's sort of what we were talking about last week is the importance of capturing that historical information of a particular asset, piece of equipment, et cetera. We need to know, you know, what its criticality is to the operation and to the business. You know, some things are just frankly more important than others because if they break downstream of that particular system, it could cause catastrophic events or emergency events. Um, whereas other assets can break and they don't necessarily cause any, you know, glaring issues or fires that need to be put out, so to speak. Um, so we need to know kind of the importance or criticality of each asset that the organization has to maintain and also what its history is. How old is it? What is its, you know, manufacturer expected lifetime? Has it had, um, you know, an, a surprisingly large amount of maintenance failures reported on it throughout its history and therefore can we assume that the asset may not actually last through its whole life cycle so that 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 historical information really needs to be captured and informed 
um, the planning and design process in addition to all of these kind of as built record and you know reality capture and other methods of getting data that we have today again that merging of sort of the past and the present becomes really important to make the right scope decisions so actually believe it or not this section we're we're we're, we're coming up on time quickly so i got another, one more question and again i'm not i'm not limiting how long it takes to answer it i'm just saying we got one more um so when we're talking about uh, the planning and design. We have planning design of, of new construction and rehabilitation or, or replacement um, for, for assets. Is one more difficult than the other uh, for the planning and design perspective? And, and if so, why? Well, yeah, I think they both have their challenges, um, and, and their challenges are somewhat unique. Um, certainly some of the challenges are the same. Um, you know, in, in our world, I would say uh, rehab replacement is is far more difficult, um, and it's for a lot of the reasons we've been talking about here. It's to, to do a really good job on the planning and design of, of rehabilitation of a, a system of assets. You have to know a lot of information about what exists presently that you're rehabilitating, you know, all the ancillary equipment and, and to Joe's point earlier, that stuff that nobody's telling you needs to be replaced, except that one guy that knows it needs to be replaced out in facilities, but he's not part of any of those discussions, right? So making sure that, you know, you can get that information to make good decisions is hugely important. Uh, and, and that's one of the challenges that we're, we're presently trying to work through with systems is, is to make sure that 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 information to make those decisions can be efficiently available uh, to folks in the planning and design stage. Now, that's not to say new new construction doesn't have its challenges. It does. Uh, it certainly does because you might be building over, you know, something that um, used to be there 50 years ago, right? So, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you might certainly need to get information about that. But but in my world, uh, rehabilitation and replacement tends to have more challenges and and more difficult challenges to overcome than new construction. Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly echo Rick's comments there. Um, you know, you'd think that a very large scale capital project costing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars is more challenging than a small one off repair or, uh, you know, minor replacement. But surprisingly, right, those small one off projects often cause the most challenges. Um, just there's there's fewer eyes on the project. There's not as much money available. We're not always able to hire a contractor to do all of this high quality precision engineering or architectural, you know, uh, work on the design. Um, and of course, you know, I think maybe most important, those projects tend to be very urgent. It's because something has broken. And so the, the level of urgency is raised. And so the, the effort really isn't there to try to capture, to, to one, plan it out in, you know, with time on your side, and then to capture information in the field and after the fact, those types of things tend to be lost in an emergency situation or a project that has a really high sense of urgency. Now, it makes sense to like if, or, or it's it's one of the the it reiterates the reason for needing to have good data because because there's there's a lot more uh, rehabilitation and replacement of uh there's a lot more assets that are in that stage than you are creating brand new uh and if you if you don't have good data and that's going to be not only harder and more frequent then it obviously compounds in terms of the difficulty and the challenges that that are there as opposed to not that that a new project is starting with a blank canvas but in comparison it's there absolutely yeah, one of, one of the points is to kind of take a, a bit of a step back to the previous question, but I, I think it answers some of this current one as well Is you know, we're talking a lot about the importance of, of kind of sharing and evaluating information within an organization, perhaps, you know, two different projects that may be going on for different reasons, making sure that, you know, both sides are communicating and they understand the, the impacts that, that may result to, to either project. But also something that we're seeing a lot lately is um, interagency coordination. So maybe a, a rail and a DOT coordinating on projects taking place in similar areas. 
um, and starting at a very simple high level, right? This is our overall um, capital improvement program. Um, this is where we're looking to conduct work, you know, overlaying that with the other agencies and, and seeing where there's commonality. Um, certainly, you know, it's an efficiency for um, for the public, less less conflict. So it's not, you know, hey, we just tore that up, you know, six months ago, and now you're, you know, doing similar work in, in that area. Um, but it can also produce cost savings, right? So if we're talking about needing to to, to get, you know, raw materials, um, per, perhaps we can, you know, cost share and, and, and leverage certain grants, or it makes us in our grant applications um, more favorable because we're, we're showing that that pre-planning up front um, and, and tackling something perhaps in one sitting more cost effectively, more safely um, than, than, than doing that work uh, in conflict. So we've seen a, a big uptick in that. Um, state agencies working together to kind of overlay that that simple information. Um, so that be it new construction, um, you know, they're, they're aware of perhaps other synergies, you know, hey, we couldn't tackle this on our own, but if we could go underneath your project, maybe we can do them both together. Um, and certainly for any type of, you know, repair, rehabilitation, you know, Joe's spot on. I mean, it, it's usually, you know, break fix, right? And everyone's scrambling. But if there is a, a process in place as to which counterparts and it, it, the various agencies to, to reach out to, to see if there's coordination efforts, um, you know, it, it can help um, with the overall project's success and, uh, and completion. All right. So we have, uh, we've checked two boxes, right? We've, we've had this conversation about data and availability from the operations and maintenance and now the planning and design. Uh, we're going to move on next week to the construction or the build phase of, of this conversation. So um, thank you again, uh, Joe, Aaron, Zach, and Rick uh, for joining us. Uh, and we're looking forward to next week as well. Everybody who's listening, watching, uh, thank you very much for, for tuning in again. Uh, and until next week, stay connected. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Connected Construction Show. For more information, visit us at ConnectedConstructionShow.com.